morning, everyone. Welcome to today's uh, mentoring hour. Um, people are just joining in. Okay. So um, I hope you have uh, you've been looking forward to today's mentoring hour. It's an interesting topic. It's uh, it's something that's been in the news for some time now, and also you know a lot of questions. Uh, I'm sure we have a lot of questions, clarifications, etc. And so we're looking forward to um, today's session. Um, okay, so let's uh, let's dive right in. Um, can somebody pray, and then we'll we'll get into today's uh, mentoring hour. Can somebody pray and commit this time into God's hands? Any one of the students, if you'd like to pray, please. Heavenly Father, we just wish to thank you for this uh, hour of mentoring. And Holy Spirit, we just pray that you'll lead us and minister to us in these times that we live in. Maybe draw closer to you, Father, as we walk by faith and not by sight. And uh, we pray for a blessing upon all the teachers and all the students in the Bible College. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you, Sanjay. Um, now, I just request um, Pastor Ashish to uh, make the presentation and also take us through this session. Over to you, Pastor. Thank you. Okay. Good morning. Um, morning, everyone. Um, thank you for connecting to the call. And um, I'll just share a few thoughts um, on, on what we are observing on, on the Middle East conflict. Uh, just a little bit of background and then a few scriptural references and then we'll just open it up for uh, our time for questions uh, and answers. Um, I'll just share something. Uh, this is um, the, the notes from our course on the end times, which we typically do in our second year, fourth semester. So those of you who uh, are going to do it or have done it, you would probably be a little familiar with this. So just to understand uh, you know, a little bit on you know what we are seeing happen right now, uh, of course, everything is surrounded or concerning Israel and the Palestinians. So Palestinians right now uh, are living across in two regions. One is known as the Gaza Strip, which is on the west coast. Uh, it's next to right along the Mediterranean Sea. And there is the West Bank, which is on the west side of River Jordan. The River Jordan flows around here. And so this, this region is known as the West Bank, west of the River Jordan. And Jerusalem, of course, is uh, the main focal point. And uh, uh, there is East Jerusalem, uh, East part of that old uh, Jerusalem, well, also if it is old city, which uh, is right now predominantly under in open to the under Jordanian control uh, and used by the Arabs the, uh, for their worship and so on. And then the western side of Jerusalem, which uh, with the Jews and Maxis. So right now, uh, the conflict that we are seeing happen, which began uh, this current conflict began uh, about a month ago. And, the Hamas, which are a militant group of the Palestinians from Gaza City, from Gaza, they you know, uh, did a surprise attack on Israel and that particular Friday, uh, Saturday, actually, uh, they killed over a thousand people. Uh, it was this harsh. And then Israel is now taking action. And of course, there's a lot of questions on you know what's right, what's wrong, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But that's the conflict. Um, from a biblical perspective, what do we need to understand? A little bit of history. Uh, uh, just go back to uh, some of the things that have happened, which we know that when you know when God called Abraham, He called him. So this this whole region, the Middle East, is is a very uh, uh, you know, 
significant, significant, very important as far as the Bible is concerned. A lot of things that we see in the Bible are happening in and around this region. Uh, God called Abraham uh, out of the earth of the Chaldees, which would be here in the modern day Iraq. And he journeyed down into this part of the uh, of being as, uh, Israel or at that time, the land of Canaan. He came here and God said, look, I'm going to give you this part, this region from the river Euphrates in the north to the river Nile in the south. So God said, I'm going to give that to you and your descendants. So that's the history behind it. And then, of course, uh, you know, uh, when Israel was, when the, the Hebrews were brought out of Egypt, they came here to conquer this land. And then they had to fight a lot of the tribes and uh, possess this land. So they had to fight against various tribes that included the Philistines, which generally, and people think, are the ancestors of what today we know as the Palestine, Palestinians. So they also have been living in the same region for a very long time. And so, you know, so both of them, both the Palestinians as well as the people of Israel, the Jews, uh, claim this to be their homeland, going back all the way to you know, Bible terms, way back there. So both claim uh, ownership of this land. So we, we were the original people here. So that's a little bit of history. And uh, of course, over you know, a lot, a lot has happened. We're not going to go through all the history. The Jews were scattered, they were dispersed, then they came back, they were scattered again, and so on. Uh, but eventually, what happened uh, again, another important uh, thing to keep in mind is about the, the worship that took place you know, uh, for the Jews, uh, the Temple Mount, or the, uh, the the region just outside of Jerusalem, or part of Old City of Jerusalem, uh, the Mount Moriah. It's a very sacred place. That's where Abraham offered Isaac. That's where David came and he bought the place. And later Solomon built the temple. So this is the place where Solomon built the first temple. That was destroyed by Nebuchadnezzar. It was rebuilt by uh, Zerubbabel. Um, uh, during Ezra and Zerubbabel's time, it was rebuilt. It was later destroyed again in 70 AD by the Romans. Uh, Herod, King Herod, prior to, prior to that, had enlarged this place. So what we know, what we see today is the enlarged area that was done by King Herod. Uh, AD 70, the Romans destroyed the temple. And then later around 1000 AD, the Muslims took over the entire region. Uh, and then that's when around 1680 or so they built their structures. So we have here on the same temple mount, uh, we have the Dome of the Rock, which we see here, and the Alexa Mosque uh, towards the, uh, the wall on the temple on the temple mount. So the Jews look at this as their sacred place. The Arabs have, or the Muslims have their sacred structures already established on the same place. And of course, for us Christians, Jerusalem and you know, all of Israel is very sacred or very uh, a special place because of our faith in Jesus Christ. So, uh, you know, uh, three major world religions have uh, their focus on Jerusalem and in and around Jerusalem. But uh, why is this significant? Now, one, of course, for the Jews, it's significant. They want this place back. They want to have their own temple here. Uh, they believe, you know, Solomon's temple. This um, place is, you know, is where Solomon built his temple. It's, it's a very sacred. It's a very sacred place to them. For us as believers, uh, as Christians, we know, and this is mentioned to us in Revelation 11, that there will be a third temple, which will be desecrated by the Antichrist in the middle of the tribulation. Revelation chapter 11. So we are also, as Christians, we're looking at what is happening in and around this place. Will this temple be rebuilt? When will it be rebuilt? And so on. So that's, again, of interest to us. Um, I'll pause here, and I'll just point us to uh, a few passages of Scripture, and then we just open it up for questions. Um, I want to point us to the, uh, the book of Ezekiel. So, 
Another very important uh, piece of Bible prophecy in Revelation, which we see in Revelation, is what we refer to as a battle of Armageddon, where the nations of the world are all going to converge around Jerusalem. So the battle of Armageddon. So uh, that is also of uh, interest to us as uh, Christians, as, you know, as we look at what's happening in the Middle East, how nations are aligning themselves, and so on. Uh, let me just quickly um, share with you another uh, graphic that would be of interest to us. Um, when we are looking at what's happening in the Middle East, uh, so the Bible speaks to us about the Battle of Armageddon, uh, Revelation 16, and then Revelation 19, also spoken of in Zechariah chapter 15. So basically, uh, we are seeing that this happens in the north, northern part of Israel, the Valley of Jezreel, that's also known as uh, Megiddo, that's where the Battle of Armageddon will take place. And various nations will align themselves. And Ezekiel, in Ezekiel chapter 38, uh, spoke about this. So uh, in Ezekiel chapter 38, uh, verses 1 to 6, um, he talks about the land of Megal, the prince of Arosh, Meshach, and Tubal. And these are really tribes uh, in, which are now part of Russia. And uh, he says, Ezekiel says, uh, God, the prince of Arosh, and Meshach, and Tubal, they will rise up and they will join hands, verse 5, with Persia, which is Iran. Ethiopia and Libya. So they will all join together and they will move. And also in verse 6, he talks about Goma and Togarma, which is modern day Turkey, tribes in Turkey. So they are all going to align themselves and they're going to move towards Israel, towards Jerusalem. They're going to attack the nation. And so he describes in Ezekiel 38, 39, how this all, um, you know, uh, the Battle of Armageddon would take place and what would happen. Um, so this is again of interest to us, looking at how all these nations are aligning themselves. The uh, other passage of scripture I just want to look at is in Joel chapter 3 uh, and verses 1 and 2, Joel 3, 1 and 2. Uh, Joel prophesied, he said, Behold, in those days and that time, when I bring back the captives of Judah and Jerusalem, so God is saying, I'm going to bring the people of the Jews back to Jerusalem after they've been dispersed. Verse 2, I will also gather all nations and bring them down to the valley of Jehoshaphat. That's the battle of Armageddon. And I will enter into judgment with them there on account of my people, my heritage Israel, whom they have scattered among the nations. They have also divided up my land. So what is God saying? He's saying, after my people, have been regathered in my land, which officially, you know, 1948, Israel you know, announced itself as a nation. People have been regathered in that land. Verse 2, God says, I will gather all nations. So can you imagine? All the nations of the world are going to turn their focus on what's happening here in Jerusalem, in Israel. And they are going to come into battle here, to a prophesied. And what is the main reason? They have also divided up my land. They have divided up my land. So this Palestinian, this Israel-Arab conflict has been going on from since 1948, since Israel declared itself as a nation. There was a six-day war in 1967 where Israel actually recaptured, uh, took over, actually captured many parts the Golan Heights, uh, part of Lebanon, uh, much of you know what we know as as, uh, as uh, the West Bank, Gaza. Actually, Israel recaptured, took over, and then in order to maintain peace, they actually recaptured Jerusalem itself and the Temple. But then, in order to maintain peace, they you know handed over part of the Temple Mount for the Arabs for them to continue worship, and so it's been in kind of a very delicate delicate position since that time. The Palestinians want their own place, Gaza and West Bank, they want their own identity. But this conflict has been going on, or you know, the, regularly there have been these wars, conflicts, killing happening. 
some would be small, some would be large. What you're seeing now is very, very significant, very large. And then other nations are trying to intervene. And almost all nations are saying, well, the solution is a two-state solution. Give Israel its land, give Palestine, or the Palestinians their land. Now, of course, Israel is refusing to do that. And here in Joel chapter 3, three verse 2, Joel prophesied, they have also divided up my land. So somehow this conflict is going to precipitate into this battle of Armageddon. Nations are going to come against Jerusalem. And there's one reason they, they want to divide up the land. In other words, it seems like they're going to try to forcibly uh, try to enforce this you know, land being given over to the Palestinians and so on. So that's what Joel prophecy. Uh, of course, we can look at a lot of other prophecies in the book of Revelation in relation to all of this. So, in a sense, the Bible has foretold conflict here in Jerusalem, uh, and that Jerusalem will be a, a point of serious conflict, and it'll lead to this battle, what we refer to as the, the uh, Battle of Armageddon. And uh, Zechariah chapter 14, once again, Zechariah also has prophesied. Uh, Zechariah 14, 2, I will gather all the nations to battle against Jerusalem. So nations are going to get involved in all of this. So let me pause here and we'll take specific questions. Um, I'm not you know, uh, doing a complete study on this, but let's take specific questions that people feel um, they would like to ask concerning the Middle East conflict. Um, so if anyone has any specific questions um, uh, that's been always on your mind, you can post it here on the chat or you can unmute and ask and um, yeah, it'll be answered. Here's a question from Esther. Um, now that we know that this conflict could lead to all other nations getting involved, as believers, how should how must we be prepared for or prepare others around us? Um, mm -hmm. So, um, so for us, um, we know uh, again from from the scriptures, the prophetic scriptures. We know when exactly. This is going to happen. We know that the Battle of Armageddon is the final conflict. And it's going to happen. It's the last thing. It's the final thing that's going to take place. And with that is the coming of the Lord. So Revelation chapter 19 talks about that. You know, As the nations are gathering in uh, 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 at the end of the, you know, the series of judgments that we have, the nations begin to gather in. And then the Lord Jesus comes. Same thing, Zechariah 14, Zechariah says that when this conflict is happening, the Lord Jesus himself will descend on Mount Olives. But we know that's when it's going to happen. And that's going to happen at the end of the seven years of tribulation. And as believers, we know that we will not be here during the seven years of tribulation. The rapture of the church will be the first thing that takes place before the clock starts ticking on the seven years. The rapture of the church and then the clock starts ticking, then seven years, right? So as believers, we will be taken out of the way. The church will be uh, caught up, raptured, and then the man of sin, Revelation chapter 6, verse 1, the man of sin who, 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 who comes riding on the white horse, the Antichrist, will be revealed. So the church is literally going to be taken away. So as believers, we need to focus on that, which is the catching away of the rapture of the church. Uh, we know that in seven years from then, there's going to be the battle of Armageddon. So we don't need to be worried about it. We will not be here at that time. So what we are going to focus on is the rapture of the church. So as a church, we need to prepare ourselves, be ready for the coming of the Lord. And what should we do for others? 
They need to focus on bringing the gospel to them, getting them saved. So that's the, our main focus. While we are looking at how the nations are aligning themselves, we see, you know, we can actually see China, Russia, Turkey, Iran, uh, some of the Middle East Arab, Arab nations, they're all aligning themselves. And on the other side, you're saying, okay, the United States, the uh, United Kingdom, some parts of Europe, they're aligning themselves. And the, the fact that these nations are aligning themselves, saying, okay, yeah, we, we, it's all this is building up to us, battle of Armageddon. We're not worried about that. We're looking at the rapture, and we have two responsibilities. One, we should live ready for the coming of the Lord to proclaim the gospel and get as many people saved so that they can be part of the great the rapture of the church. That's how, I mean, that should be our focus as a church. Thank you, Pastor. I think that uh, clears uh, a lot of things to focus on the rapture and what you know leads up to that. Um, okay, here's a uh, this is from Lucy. Uh, the conflicts which are happening around us, most most of them are around our rapture. So why are we experiencing much earlier before rapture? Why are we experiencing these conflicts before rapture? So Lucy, uh, just to no, state it correctly, these conflicts are actually a build up to that battle of Armageddon. Right? So, if you, if you when you read in Matthew 24, the disciples are Jesus, Lord, what will be the signs of your coming? So, then Jesus begins to give a lot of signs. Matthew 24, the first 15 verses, you know, he talks about famines, pestilences, wars, rumors of wars, uh, 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 false Christs, all of these things are happening. But these are a prelude. That means they are a builder to the coming uh, of the Antichrist, the beginning of the tribulation. Because then he says, after he gives all of that, then he says, then you, there will be this man of sin, the son of desolation, whom Daniel spoke of, about. That's the Antichrist, right? So we are in that, the early part of Matthew 24, where all these things are happening, these things will happen. These conflicts, wars, rumors of wars, pestilences, epidemics, all these things will be happening. But these are all preloaded. Then the rapture of the church. Then will be the great tribulation, meaning these things will escalate. And when you read from Revelation 6 onwards, everything is magnified many times over. The kind of devastation that takes place during the tribulation is much more than what we are see, seeing right now. So the things we're experiencing are only a lead up to the great tribulation, uh, the, the seven years of tribulation, and the second half of the tribulation is referred to as the great tribulation, be even, even more devastating. Right. Thank you, Pastor. Right. Um, so uh, one quick question is, um, so, uh, since this is all this is unfolding before us, um, um, and we know the, the mandate of the church is to go ahead, share the gospel, etc. So, but uh, what should be the stand of the church? You know, because we get asked that question many times. You know, so uh, even recently, you know, so what are you? You know, are you for Jerusalem? Is Jerusalem? Okay? I mean, is is Israel uh, right in doing this? In in this kind of. Um, you know, uh, retaliation and so on. So, um, so how should we look at this on one side? Because we know this is Bible prophecy unfolding. Uh, on the other side, we see the uh, like the human, um, uh, you know, uh, the the devastation that is happening, and the, um, yeah, the, and and when we see we see the injustice. So, how should we really see this? How should we respond to this? Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, so this is a very, very difficult question, very challenging question. Uh, because if you look at it just from a, you know, from a objective, look at it very objectively. Uh, of course, what Hamas did a month ago was wrong. Right? They did a surprise attack and uh, killed over a thousand Israelis. That was wrong. Innocent civilians. It was wrong. But people look say and say, well, the reason Hamas did it was because of the oppression that they were suffering. 
for a long time, for many decades, since 1967. So we are talking about almost 50 years. So they were being oppressed, and this is part of that whole retaliation or aggression, showing that they don't want to tolerate that oppression. So that's how they justify their action. Israel as a nation, in doing what they're doing, they're saying, look, we are going after Hamas. We want to completely destroy them for what they've done to our people. We have a right to protect our own citizens. And so Israel is justifying their actions. So they're going after Hamas. But the sad part is innocent civilians are caught in the middle of this. Right? And that's where the tragedy is that uh, literally thousands, I think the numbers crossed 10,000 now, uh, of innocent people have been caught in this whole conflict. So it's very difficult uh, to, I mean, both sides do have the reasons to justify their actions. And I'm talking about the, the Hamas, the militant group, and, and Israel in taking and defending themselves. Um, what should our response be? Our response should definitely be that we, we do not want, and nobody wants, innocent civilians to suffer. Uh, so whatever can be done to protect them should be done. Now, you know, these are, we can only express our opinions. <laughs> it's the leaders of the nations who are ultimately going to make their decisions, and they're going to lead their nations the way they feel most correct. But uh, you know, we can only express our opinion saying, look, we definitely care about the civilians who are suffering. They should not suffer like this. But at the same time, we understand both sides, where they're coming from. Uh, the Palestinians feel they're mistreated for a long time. Uh, their voices aren't being heard. These Israelis, of course, want to protect their own people, defend their own land. Uh, we understand both sides. And I think. I think we should be, in that sense, neutral. That means we are being humane uh, we are, because we don't want people are people, whether they are Palestinians or Israelis, they are people. God created them both, and we need to care for them both. Uh, but as believers, we understand from a biblical prophetic point of view where this is all leading to eventually. Nations are going to get involved. It's going to lead to that. Uh, and so we, we know biblically this is what's going to play out. So we are very aware of it. And we want to pray it just in our hearts to say, Lord, let there be peace in Jerusalem. So I think our position should be humane. That means we are all humans. We care about people. Biblically, we understand how things are going to unfold. And we want to pray for peace and Jerusalem. So we really are not necessarily taking sides, but we are being objective in our assessment of things, response to things. So, um, so Pastor, just to follow up. So, working towards peace um, is that uh, is that okay? When we know that the end is going to be um, conflict and even more conflict, um, working towards peace and. Um, um, and also even humanitarian support uh, would that be would that be okay would that be right like if the church would uh, take up that stand uh, I'm sorry uh, we are working towards peace but uh, yeah and also follow up with humanitarian support for those who are suffering in in the yeah. region um, so but we know at the end that it is only eventually going to be more conflict nation against nation. So, um, like, even the whole aspect of praying for peace. Um, so, how do we see that? Um, praying for peace, working towards peace, and uh, you know, humanitarian support for those who mm. are suffering. Mm. Uh, in the light of uh, again Bible prophecy, that um, eventually this is how it's going to end up. Mm. How do we, uh, yeah, work work that out? Um, yeah, I think. See, I, I think we must. And, I, and I, it's easy for me to talk because I'm not doing anything. <laughs> it's like we are here, we are not really doing anything, but I'm just speaking in general terms. For, for people who may have the opportunity to do something, like to actually bear on the situation, um, uh, we definitely must work for peace. That is, we don't want people to suffer. 
whether they're Israelis or Palestinians. We don't want anyone to suffer. So we definitely have to work for peace. So we must definitely, uh, those who can, must provide humanitarian aid to help those who are caught in this conflict, uh, both sides. Uh, I, right now, it's primarily the Palestinians. They need help. So we definitely have to you know, be able to get help to them. And the goal must be to resolve this in a peaceful manner. Now, we know things are going to end up in, a, in the Battle of Armageddon. But I think we should look at, uh, we just look at another example. For instance, we know that one day this planet, according to Second Peter chapter 3, is going to be, be destroyed with fire. Everything is going to be destroyed. There's going to be new heavens and new earth. But yet, at the same time, today, we do whatever we can to take care of the planet. That means, you know, each one does their little bit of you know, trying to protect the planet or the environment. We don't live with the attitude that, hey, I know this planet is going to be destroyed and there's going to be new heavens and new earth, so I don't care about it now. No, we don't live like that. Right? We, even though we know what the future is good holds, we li live um, as good stewards today. Okay? So I think we would apply the same logic here into this situation where we know eventually how things are going to turn out. There's going to be this great conflict. But today, what can we do to care for people? What can we do to you know, help the people? What can we do to maintain peace? Those, are, those should be our efforts. Although we know that eventually the way things are going to unfold is going to be in uh, final conflict here. Right, Pastor. Thank you. Uh, we have a few questions here um, from Sanjay. The church is divided as far as rapture is concerned. Many believe only the second coming or a post-trib rapture. Will the rapture be only for those who are waiting on the Lord Jesus Christ or is it for all believers who are still asleep? Mm. Yeah, so Sanjay, um, we know what the scriptures say in the sense of the description of the rapture. We have this in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 14 to 18, and also in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, the second part of it, verse 45 to 58, uh, where the Apostle Paul in both these passages describe what exactly will happen in the rapture. Uh, uh, in the rapture, everyone who, are, who have died in Christ prior to that, and those who are alive, we will all be changed for a moment when we meet the Lord in the air. So, like you pointed out, yes, the church, uh, they have different, the people have different posi positions on when this is going to take place. Will it take place before the tribulation, middle of the tribulation, end of the tribulation? And some don't believe in that, that they're, they're uh, millennials. Uh, the other, there's another group as well. Uh, we will study that in detail in our end course on end times in the fourth semester. Um, but our position, and I'm just saying uh, as a church, our position is we believe in a pre tribulation, pre tribulation rapture of the church. It means the church will be taken out of the way. And uh, you know we can give many reasons to back up that statement, which we will do in our course on the end times in our fourth semester. Uh, but I'll just maybe uh, just as one 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 reference, I'll point to Second Thessalonians chapter two, verse one to eight, where the apostle Paul writes and says that that which restrains is restraining, and when that which restrains is taken out of the way, then the man of sin the son of perdition will come. So that which restrains, um, we can show that he's actually referring to the church because the Holy Spirit is going to be operating on the earth, even through the tribulation. People are going to be saved. 144,000 Jews are going to be anointed in power. The two, uh, Revelation 7, Revelation 11, they're going to be the two witnesses anointed by God operating throughout the second half of the tribulation. So we see the activity of the Holy Spirit throughout the tribulation. So the Holy Spirit is not taken out of the way, so obviously then the church is taken out of the way. And that's why we believe in a pre-tribulation rapture church. But there are more reasons that we can state. But I will pause here. Um, thank you, Pastor. 
Sanjay, I hope that helped. There's another question from Warren James. Uh, I've seen many preachers pray for Israel, but they stop short of praying for the Palestinians caught in the conflict. Shouldn't we be praying for everyone caught up in this conflict? Um, I think you kind of answered that earlier on, um, that we should be humane, we should be helping. But um, your thoughts, Pastor? Uh, should we be, shouldn't we be praying for everyone? Yeah, definitely we, uh, we should, you know, we should uh, engage them. We should pray for everybody, right? Um, let just look the scripture up. Uh, Psalm 46 verse 9 says that God makes wars to cease. He makes wars to cease to the ends of the earth. So that is our God. He's a God of peace. He's the God who uh, he makes wars to cease. Um, Psalm 46 verse 9. So we pray that, Lord, you know, let this thing come to an end. You cause this war to cease. Uh, so we should definitely pray for just all people who are involved. The Bible teaches us that, right? And in 1 Timothy 2, Peter, Tim, sorry, Paul wrote, you know, pray for all men. So pray for those who are in authority. I pray for all that we may live peacefully. So that's part of what we pray. We don't take sides. It's not that Israel life is more important than the palace. No, people are people. They are all important. Uh, we should be praying. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Pastor. Um, and I think Nina's uh, Nina John's question is also answered. Um, she says, "Shouldn't we be praying for people of Israel and Palestine?" Uh, who do not recognize and believe in the Messiah, uh, in a Jesus, that he's the peace. So, um, yeah. um, any other questions, Nina, uh, apart from this, um, you can post it. Uh, Esther's question, um, are there any series, messages, or APC publication which is available regarding, regarding the end times chronology of events? Um, yes, we do have a series on the end times uh, that we did. And um, I'll try and post that, um, post the link here. Um, we'll do that. Um, Nina Johns, Romans 9, 6 says, for they are not all Israel who are of Israel. How do we understand this? Romans 9, verse 6. Yeah. So in Romans chapters 9, 10, and 11, uh, Paul is, uh, is talking about natural Israel, and he's talking about the church. So, um, yes, we need to understand this in Paul's writing. So what Paul is emphasizing is uh, that, and then so you, you, you need to read Romans 9, 10, 11 together, because in 11, he brings out the summary of what he's saying, where, and I will just kind of reference Romans 11, where he's saying that God is going to continue working with natural Israel. That means uh, Jews, as we talk about, people are born as descendants of Abraham, part of Israel, the Jews. That's natural Israel. But God has also, through the church, initiated what you know we would refer to as spiritual Israel, or those who are born again through Jesus Christ. So we are also considered descendants of Abraham like he says in Galatians 3, through Christ. So that means, you know, in one sense, we are, quote unquote, spiritual Jews, if you want to say that. Because, you know, in Galatians 3, Paul says, if you are Christ's, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. That's in Galatians 3. Okay? So basically, Paul is talking about spiritual Israel or believers, the church as being, Spiritual Israel, or spiritual descendants, paper. So that's what he's talking about, right? So Romans 9, 10, 11, you can look at it in, in context with Galatians 3 and 4. It, it, it brings clarity. So there, there's natural Israel, and there, there, there's a church, which in one sense Paul alludes to and refers to as the spiritual Israel, although he never uses that term. By inference, we can use that term. So that's the distinction. And the summary is in Romans 11, which is God is working through both. 
God has not given up on natural Israel. Everything he promised for them, he will fulfill. And he's actually working to bringing us all together to faith in Christ. Thank you, Pastor. Hope that helped, uh, Nina. And if you have any further questions, you can post. Um, and also, Esther, Pastor Nancy has posted the link um, on um, the end time series that we did some time back. So you can go through that. I think it's a series of, of four or five messages. You can check that out. Okay. Six messages, actually. Yeah. Okay. Any further questions? Um, it could be about what we've been discussing so far or any other related topics or even completely different uh, topics that you have questions on, um, you could ask. Uh, yes, Pastor, I'd like to ask a question. Um, so we find that uh, some of the churches, some of the preachers, as Warren said earlier, um, that they take sides and uh, even the preaching is very... Uh, you know, like very focused on bless Israel and you know, Israel. We support Israel, uh, and I think uh, it, it's being termed as being Zionist. Um, so, Pastor, I know you've already mentioned we need to pray for both uh, the both the the people groups. But any comments on that, Pastor, about the church and preachers taking sides and uh, leading people to to focus only on Israel, bless Israel, and so on. Mm. Um, I, I, you know, I, I wouldn't. Okay, I'm just sharing my thoughts here. I'm listening. I, I feel that that kind of an approach is poor judgment because they are not looking at things objectively. They're not looking at people as people. Right. Uh, anybody who's suffering needs help, whether they are, you know, Jews or Palestinians or any other nationality or group. We have to look at people because people and help them, and that's uh, that's what the Bible teaches, and that's who God is. Right? Who is God? Psalm one forty five, six seven eight. The Lord is good to all, and His tender mercies are over all his works. Jesus taught us, Matthew 5, he said, the Lord God makes the sun to shine on the good and the bad. He makes the rain to fall on the good and the evil. That means you know, God has, he's, he's kind to everybody. So I think that should be our position, while at the same time we acknowledge this God's working in Israel as a nation. We know that biblically. At the same time, we should be very practical, very objective in how we care for people, love people, and so on. So taking that position, as you indicated, that some you know, Christian leaders do, personally, I wouldn't, I don't appreciate that. I wouldn't support it. Uh, I, I, I wish the church didn't do that. Uh, but it's sad that that's actually happening. Thank you, Pastor. That's very helpful. Thank you. Thanks, Pastor. Thank you, Nancy, for that question. And uh, um, we have a um, couple of scriptures shared here by John Paul. And his question is, do these verses imply the current events? One is uh, Zephaniah 2, 4. For Gaza shall be forsaken and Ashkelon desolate. They shall drive out Ash Ashdod at noonday, uh, etc. And Ekron shall be uprooted, then Zechariah 9 5. Uh, I think there was a lot of forwards um, saying that, you know, this is, you know, it's it's already written here, this this particular conflict. It's already in the Bible. And I think that's the reason for these questions. Are these verses implying what is actually unfolding before us right now? Mm. So, um, so, John, so uh, every time we read scripture, uh, we need to look at uh, so so scripture. There is you know what we refer to as the immediate or near time fulfillment, 
And then there is scripture that is prophetic in the sense of it being out in the future or talking about the end times. And distinguishing that is always a challenge. So how do we, how can we recognize if there's a prophetic element to these passages like the ones we quoted? One way to tell is if that same aspect is repeated in the New Testament in some form. So case in point, Ezekiel 38 had an immediate fulfillment, a near time fulfillment where, you know, the, the, uh, uh, so the regathering of people had a near time fulfillment, but it all Ezekiel 30, 37. And then Ezekiel 38 is reinforced for us in the New Testament, in the book of Revelation. So that's why we can look back at passages like Ezekiel 38, Zechariah 14, Joel chapter 3, and then say that there is a prophetic element in all of these. Prophetic means an end time element in all of these passages because there is the New Testament also in speaking of the same thing. For the verses that we just mentioned in Zechariah 2, 4, and Zechariah 9, 5, we don't have that same thing happening from the New Testament, right? So there is a near time fulfillment, which actually happens. The land was desolate, they were forsaken of the kings. But can we take these same passages and then say they are prophetic in nature, referring to the end times? No, because we don't have anything, say in the book of Revelation especially, pointing back to this and saying, this is, also going to happen in the end times. We don't have that, unlike what we do have for Joel 3, Zechariah 14, and this is the year. So my response to these two passages would be that they had a near-time fulfillment and we should leave it with that. Just because you know they sound good <laughs> given today's times doesn't mean we should introduce a prophetic element because the in the Bible, we don't find that. That's how I would look at it. Otherwise, we could take a lot of Old Testament scriptures and start saying all these are, you know, prophetic, when actually it's not. They all had a near time fulfillment in those days itself. Right, Pastor. Thank you. Um, um, we have another question from Nina John. Are the blessings promised by the Lord, are they at a spiritual level or does physical Israel have a privileged place? Yeah, so um, physical is a natural Israel, does have a privileged place. Uh, God is dealing with natural Israel. And in fact, according to what Daniel said, Daniel chapter 9, verse 24 to 27, uh, Angel Gabriel, uh, he came and he spoke to Daniel, and he spoke about the 70 years, 470 weeks. And the last seven weeks, he said, and these 70 weeks are very specifically for Israel. The last seven weeks, which is the seven years of tribulation, all has to do with natural Israel and how they are going to be affected. So uh, the blessings, the judgments, God's dealings with natural Israel is continuing, and it will be heightened in the seven years of tribulation, which are on Daniel 9.24. It was very specific. That's why those seven years of tribulation called are referred to as the time of Jacob's trouble, Daniel chapter 12. That seven years, that is, it's actually God's judgment, uh, and, and a lot of it has to do with natural history. So the blessings also apply to them. The judgments also apply to them. Same thing, God's dealings with the spiritualism of the church. Uh, whatever God has spoken to the church, of course, applies to the church. Uh, so to answer your question, you know, both, there is God's dealings with both, the blessings of them both. Unless your question has something else in it, Nina, I'm not sure. Um, then I hope that, uh, Nina, I hope that answers your question. Yeah, okay, thank you. Um, we, we just have a minute uh, close, so, um, so I guess we'll close, pray and close. Um, yeah, I think it's 8.50 now. We'll pray and close. Thank you, Pastor. Thank you so much for 
uh, answering these questions. And thank you, everyone, for posting these questions. Um, it, it's been a very fruitful session. Why don't we just pray, and then we'll close, right? Father, we thank you for this time. We thank you for Lord, all that is unfolding before us, Lord, uh, in your time and in, in your purpose. And Lord, as a church, Lord, may we rise up and take our rightful place, Lord, in uh, in fulfilling the Great Commission. Lord, each one of us taking our position as, in terms of identity and intimacy. And Lord, uh, taking the gospel out of Father God to a dying world. And Master, we, we pray for the people of Israel. We pray for the people of Palestine, even right now, today, God. Father, we pray for peace, Lord, uh, amidst this conflict. And Father, we pray that um, there will be humanitarian aid which will reach them. And I just pray that it will be a time of, Lord, turning towards you, who's the Prince of Peace. And I pray that eyes will be open, that hearts will be, Lord, drawn to you, O Father God, and to the redemptive work of the cross, Lord, that you are um, extending for each and every person. Lord, we thank you. We commit this day into your mighty hands. In Jesus' matchless name, we pray. Amen. Amen. Right, thank you, everyone. Looking forward to next uh, mentoring hour. Thank you. God bless. Bye-bye.